Well, good morning and welcome to episode four in season one of our, of our Winnovations webinar series. I'm your host, Kyle A. Richards, and we have a really great and exciting session planned for this morning. Now, the purpose of these webinars is to highlight the exciting uh, and innovative work that's being done within our department here at the University of Wisconsin. But we also want to really generate a wider discussion within the broader urology community so that we all can continue to work together to make innovative advancements in urologic care for our patients. Now, the format for today's session will be a 20 minute presentation. We're going to break it up into two halves so that there'll be five minute question and answer in the middle and then five minutes question and answer at the end. Now, feel free to enter in any questions in the chat or comments at any time during the presentation, as I'll be monitoring that closely for our speaker. Now, our next webinar will actually be in 2023. We're currently planning our speaker list, so please stay tuned as we release that in the months to come. But I am excited to announce that we will be, we will be releasing an interview with myself and my boss and chair of our department, Dr. Stephen Nakata in December, going over some of the highlights from our first four episodes, as well as some future directions for our Winnovation series. Now, I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Margaret Knadler, who's our featured speaker this morning. Dr. Knadler recently joined our department in 2021 after completing her residency here at the University of Wisconsin, as well as her endourology fellowship under the tutelage of Dr. Steve Nakata. In addition to her endourology urology practice, she's working hard to develop novel approaches to kidney stone surgery and is really passionate about her topic for today, which is new frontiers in laser technology. So with no further ado, uh, Dr. Margaret Knadler. Well, thank you, Dr. Richards. Thank you for having me today. Um, so I just figured I would start with a little bit of history. Um, so ureteroscopy is, with laser lithotripsy is one of the first cases you learn as a resident. So it's easy to overlook the radical advance it is in uh, stone treatment. This image shows an early version of low lithotomy where the patient is manually held in place. And for a millennia, the only advance in stone treatment was going from transperineal to transurethral bladder stone removal. But since the introduction of flexible ureteroscopy in the 1960s to the advent of laser lithotripsy in 1993 to today, the treatment of urolithiasis has drastically advanced. Um, and laser technology continues to evolve as well. There are a lot of different laser machines. You probably recognize at least one of them in this picture. But regardless of which one you have, there are really only two basic types of laser, the holmium and the thulium. The holmium laser is the gold standard for treating uh, stones and is the most common av laser available in the US. A recent modification of the holmium laser has been MOSES technology, which allows for which is allowed for in the high power P120 laser. The thulium fiber laser um, is a new is newer to the market in the last two years and has shown promising results in clinical practice. So to start with, I'm going to talk about the settings and techniques for laser lithotripsy. These uh, techniques and settings can be used with either the holmium or the thulium laser. And then we'll talk about recent advances, including MOSES technology, the thulium fiber laser, um, as well as uh, some soft tissue applications for the laser and uh, a few safety things to be aware of. So how to maximize your laser. As a urologist, you have control over the laser settings and the technique you use. So settings include the energy delivered to the stone in joules, the frequency at which the energy is delivered in hertz, and this is how fast you're treating the stone, and then also high power lasers also let you control the pulse width, um, which is how long it takes to deliver each individual pulse. Um, and then I do also wanna highlight um, the total power, which is the energy times the frequency. 
Although you are individually, individually adjusting the energy and the frequency, it's the overall power that, has the that is the most important factor when looking at your settings. Increased power has increased ability to break up stones, but also increases the risk of injury, which we'll get to later. Um, and then a quick note about pulse width. So first generation um, Holmium lasers only had the short pulse width, which is about 350 microseconds. Um, the newer high power lasers actually have longer pulse width settings. This is less energy with each pulse, but also less retropulsion, so less um, movement, migration of the stone away from the laser. So to put all of these things together, um, there are kind of three basic types of treatment for the stone. You can fragment stone and basket extract the fragments. You can dust the stone into tiny particles that then pass on their own. And there's also popcorning the stone. So here I have um, some of my default settings for fragmentation. So this is generating larger particles to basket extract. And um, for this uh, setting, you want um, a high energy and a low frequency setting, the short pulse duration. Um, and I will often start with these settings and then kind of adjust them as needed throughout the case. So dusting involves generating smaller particles that will pass on their own. For this, you want a low energy setting with high frequency. Um, usually above 40 hertz. Uh, my default is I start with about 70 hertz. Um, and then you can adjust kind of based on how the stone is breaking up. And then one thing to note is that dusting settings uh, do require a high power laser. Um, so while both fragmentation and dusting require contact with the stone for best results, popcorning is a non-contact lasing technique. This is where the ureter scope sits at the entrance of the calyx and you press down on the laser pedal and the fragments fly around and hit the laser, causing them to break into smaller pieces. This requires moderate energy and moderate frequency. So now that we've talked about the settings and techniques, um, I wanna move on to more recent advances in laser lithotripsy. So Moses technology, um, this is used with a high power P120 laser. It's a modulated laser pulse. So you can see in this top one, this shows the regular holmium where there's one um, laser burst. And then on the bottom, you can see this modulated laser burst where the first burst splits the water or splits the Red Sea like Moses did. And then the second burst can hit the stone unobstructed, um, delivering the maximal energy to the stone. So it is, you do need the higher power laser to use Moses, set, Moses settings. And the expected benefits are reduced retropulsion, higher stone ablation with shorter time to fragmentation. So we decided to test this question. Um, does Moses technology clinically improve operative time? So in a retrospective review of 176 patients, we compared our patients who were treated with the high power homium laser versus the high power homium laser with Moses. Um, we found no statistically significant difference in operative or procedural time with similar stone free rates and similar low complication rates. So when using a high power laser for laser lithotripsy, um, Moses does not shorten OR time. So although there may be some subtle advantages to Moses, I don't think it's a, quite a game changer. We're gonna pause here for, for some questions. Is that, is that okay, Dr. Knedler? Yes, that sounds great. Great. So I, I wanted to just uh, this this study that uh, that you guys published is is very interesting uh, to me, and although it wasn't you know statistically significant with the p value you know point one nine five, um, it does look though that there's about a ten you know if you look at the uh, 
the time of the OR procedure is about a 10 minute difference with the Moses. And we, we, we hear this that every minute matters in the OR because uh, in the OR minutes are dollars. So do you think, although it's not statistically significant, it, what's your anecdotal experience though? Do you, do you feel like you're getting through the case faster or in, in, in to the OR 10 minutes might be clinically relevant? Um, yeah, as, as Dr. Nakata just said, if it's not statistically significant, it's not statistically significant. Um, yes, I would say, you know, I think if there was a real advantage to Moses, I think we would have seen it, um, uh, in the, in the study, but that being said, um, you know, I think that Moses technology does have some benefits. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you definitely anecdotally can see less retropulsion with Moses technology. Um, you know, if you start lasering the stone and it starts flying back into a calyx and then you're spending extra time um, chasing it, that definitely adds on time to the procedure. So, um, you know, I think in individual cases, it can definitely speed up the procedure. But I think when you're thinking about am I going to buy the Moses technology to kind of decrease operative time? Um, you know, I don't think it's going to decrease it enough that that it would kind of be worth it. So. There's a question from the chat uh, that says, uh, "What? So, what laser?" And this is from Dr. Nakata. What laser should the practicing urologist use if they could only have one? So, if, if they could only choose one, which one should which one should it be? Um, so that's a great question. I think that is one that, you know, it's the million dollar question everyone wants to know. Um, I would say that at this point, I would still pick the um, P120 Holmium laser with Moses. Um, you know, right now we're just talking about stones. And I think with stones, we could, you could either go with the Holmium or the Thulium, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but, you know, I do a lot of hole-ups in my or in my practice, and I think that um, the benefits of MOSIS and of having the high-power laser, um, especially with tissue ablation, are, are very helpful. Um, you can still do that with the Thulium, as I will show, but, uh, um, but I, I just prefer the, the MOSIS laser. So it's, and, and I believe that's actually a quarter of a million uh, dollars, <laughs> not a million. <laughs> um, good. Yeah. And I think uh, back when I was uh, in my training, le I learned from uh, uh, Dr. Dina Simos, who recently re retired as the chair at UAB. And I remember uh, his practice was when you're, when you're in the ureter, this was pre high powered laser days. Uh, it was the, sort of the homium. A basic homium laser. It was the settings were 0.6 and 6, and then in the kidney you could go up to 0.8 and 8. Uh, so how do you approach uh, stones in the ureter versus stones in the kidney? Does that change your uh, settings or your your idea when you're approaching those? Yeah, yeah. I think it's a great question. I think they're um, you know my settings are definitely lower in the ureter. Um, I definitely do not dust in the ureter. Um, and we'll show some kind of data in um, in a minute about kind of some of the damage that can be done with high power settings in the ureter. But um, um, in the ureter, I try to stay under 10 watts. Um, so, you know, I I will go up to um, uh, point or 10 and point one, and um, but um, yeah, I try to stay under 10 watts. Um, that's kind of the main thing is the, the overall power to think about. Um, and then I'll also, um, when I'm in the ureter, I'll start by kind of lasering kind of the middle of the stone and then working out to stay away from the ureteral wall. Whereas in the kidney, um, you know, we often talk about kind of painting the surface or starting on the edges to kind of dust the stone so that you have all the very small pieces. But in the ureter, I try to kind of avoid the ureter wall, start in the middle of the stone um, until the pieces kind of fall in so that you can kind of prevent damage to the ureter wall. Yeah, that makes sense. And then there's also, I think along those lines, there's there's almost, uh, you know, two different camps when it comes to treating stones. There's sort of the, the dusters and then the basketers and extractors. 
Uh, where where do you fall in that great debate and 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 why? <laughs> um, yeah, so I I would definitely call myself a duster. Um, I will fragment in the ureter if I know it's safe to kind of flush out the fra the fragments. Um, but um, up in the kidney, I will definitely dust stones. Um, I think there are a couple benefits to it. Um, you know, especially with our newer lasers, with high power lasers, you really can push those dusting settings so you can get very, very fine dust. Um, so that kind of um, increases your efficiency. Um, you know, if you are dusting, you don't need a ureteral access sheath, which has the risk of damaging the ureter. Um, and then you're not um, fragmenting this, you're not extracting fragments, so you're not kind of pulling those fragments along the ureteral wall, also increasing the risk of, of damage. So. so, so what I'm hearing you say is, in your mind, it's a, a maybe a little bit safer to to dust. I guess the downside is you might leave some fragments behind that could be not insignificant. Correct. And, um, you know, previous studies have shown that um, kind of stone free rate between fragmentation and dusting is similar. So, um, you know, even though the idea of removing all the fragments um, sounds better, I think that um, both of them are, are good ways to go. Yeah, and Dr. Nakata commented, you can you can leave fragments behind with basket extraction too. So that's that's very very true, and I think it's a it's an interesting uh, question, and and I'm, I, I believe an ongoing discussion that I see at a lot of the endo meetings. So, uh, so we probably don't have time to get into all the nuance of of that debate. So why don't we move forward with the second half, and we'll have some time at the end for more Q and A. So keep uh, take it away, Margaret. All right, it sounds good. So I think this is probably what everyone's interested in, is the thulium fiber laser. Um, so this is a new laser that's been on the market for the past couple of years. Um, it, uh, as opposed to the Holmium, which has been on the market since 1993, um, this has a wavelength of 1940 nanometers. So this means that it is kind of closer to the absorption coefficient of water. Um, so it's absorbed four times better in the water than the holmium. And the expected benefits are more efficient stone lithotripsy and kind of less tissue penetration because it's absorbed and has um, less kind of depth of penetration. So um, a couple things about comparing the two. So what I wanted to highlight here is that kind of the biggest difference between the holmium and the thulium um, for settings is the maximal pulse frequency. Um, and this is really important when it comes to dusting stones. And as I mentioned, I, I do dust stones. That is kind of my main practice in the kidney. Um, so the thulium laser has really shown itself to be a dusting laser. Um, it melts the stone away into small particles um, with the high frequency settings. Um, some other considerations the, um, the P120 holmium laser is significantly larger than the thulium, and it also requires a special plug in the operative room. Um, so a lot of times this plug's installed in a couple of ORs, and if you accidentally have your case in a different OR, you can't use the, you can't use the laser. And um, the, these differences are kind of due to the fact that the holmium is a flash lamp laser. Um, I won't get into too many details about that, but pretty much it means it's a larger footprint laser um, and it's it's more delicate because um, it has these mirrors inside there that amplify the laser. Whereas the thulium is a diode laser, which means it's a smaller um, footprint and it can cone down the energy um, into a smaller beam. And that kind of leads to kind of the fiber size. So the smallest fiber you can have with the holmium is that 200 micron fiber. Um, and with the thulium, you can actually get down to 150 microns. Theoretically, 50 microns, but the, um, they're very delicate at that, at that size and they're not in clinical use currently. But with the 150 micron laser, um, you can have better irrigation around the fiber um, better deflection of the ureteroscope with the fiber um, extended. And then um, it also has the ability to kind of dust into smaller particles because you have kind of a smaller um, beam um, touching the stone. 
So, um, you know, at UW, we wanted to know if um, if one of if the holmium with Moses or the solium fi laser fiber was better. So we did perform a randomized controlled trial of the two lasers. Um, we had 108 patients. Um, they were randomized to holmium with Moses or solium fiber laser. Um, and we really showed no difference in ureter scope time. Um, 21 minutes for Moses, 20 minutes for the thulium laser. These are all outpatient cases, um, ureteral and renal stones. Um, and we did break the, the stones down based on Hounsou units, stone location, and then whether stones were um, larger or smaller than one centimeter. And we still found no difference in, um, in ureter scope time between the two. And then also stone free rates and complications were similar. So I think that there might be certain instances where one laser performs better than um, than the other, but I would say kind of if you're looking for one laser that is going to do a good job of treating stones, um, both of them, both of them are are, are good lasers. Um, and then um, I know that some people are very interested in soft tissue applications for the laser because not everyone is just treating stones all day long. So um, I did want to just briefly touch on um, touch on the thulium laser with soft tissue application. So the thulium has a four times higher absorption in water compared to the um, the holmium. So it is actually really good with treating upper tract tumors and stricture disease. Um, and this is because of how hemostatic it is. So this picture is actually from a ureter seal incision, but it kind of shows those charred edges, really not much bleeding at all. We didn't have to spend any extra time with hemostasis. And with upper tract tumors, it's really been shown um, anecdotally, not in the study, that um, uh, you have such good hemostasis, you're able to kind of spend more time up in the kidney treating tumors. Um, and then um, hole up versus thule up. So you can use the holmium laser or the thulium laser for enucleation of the prostate. There was a randomized controlled trial recently that compared the two. This was in Europe. It had 200 patients. Um, and it did show that both um, relieved urinary symptoms. Um, they were both highly eff efficacious and um, safe. Um, there, the one of the differences they did show was that the thulium had um, uh, less blood loss, um, although this was based on hemoglobin checks the day after surgery. So I think it's really hard to um, quantify that in a study. Um, but but they both are. Um, able to treat um, treat the pro prostate for enucleation. Um, so um, one other thing that I wanted to mention is that we now have these high power lasers that are efficient, effective at treating stones, ablating tissue, and enucleating prostates. Um, but with all this power, there are some unintended consequences. There's always been an understanding that if misfired, the laser can directly damage the ureteral wall or renal tissue. But recently, it's also been recognized that the laser can cause a rise in temperature in the surrounding tissue. So this is a picture of PVC tubing from a recent study we performed. Um, this is Dr. Antar's study, our, our fellow. And um, this was a artificial um, ureter in which stones were treated with either the thulium or the holmium with Moses laser. And you can see just from treating the stone in the tubing, there was significant damage to the, to the uh, PVC tubing, um, significantly more with the thulium than with the holmium laser. So um, in this study, we did look at the maximal temperature of the fluid in the PVC tubing. Um, and both lasers produced significantly high temperatures, with the thulium getting up to a temperature of 157 degrees um, with the fine dusting settings. 
So these are um, these settings are kind of those really high um, frequencies that we can't produce with the whole medium laser, but um, kind of allows you to dust the the fragments more with this William laser. So um, a couple things for preventing thermal damage. You know, I think we have we don't quite know exactly how this. Um, uh, relates to overall renal function or risk of damage to the ureter, but um, but these are a couple of tips just to prevent thermal damage in your practice. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I try to stay under 10 watts in the ureter, and then in the kidney, I try to stay under 25 watts. Um, and this is um, uh, this is just to prevent any thermal damage, any unintended injury to the ureteral wall. Um, and then other kind of things to think about is um, uh, you don't need warmed fluids when you're doing your ureteroscopy because the laser will really um, heat the, the fluid up significantly. So I always use room temperature fluid and try to have adequate irrigation. Um, so, so we've come a long way from transperineal stone removal and manually holding patients in low lithotomy. Uh, but there's still more, much more to learn. We've just started to scratch the surface of how best to use lasers, the lasers at our disposal, and no doubt there will continue to be improvements in both our techniques and our technologies. So thank you. Thanks, thanks again, Dr. Knadler. Uh, we we do have some a few minutes for some questions. So uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to enter them in the chat. Uh, fascinating work, uh, and and you, and it's clear that your your team and group is really moving the, this th these technologies forward and 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 studying them, correct? Because you've got this these new lasers, and I mean, I think the real question that I have is, are they safe? And um, so, with the thulium laser and some of the data that uh, you and Dr. Antar have shown in the lab with the with the thermal um, uh, data, is that is it safe to use that in the ureter at, at, at this point in time, or do we need more information? Yeah, I think it's um, it's a good question. So, when the thulium laser came out, there were uh, a few reports of ureteral injuries with the thulium um, laser that um, were very concerning. And I think a lot of it was kind of not understanding that the thulium laser is different than the holmium laser, and that um, and that we have to be careful with the the settings that we use. Um, so there is kind of a, a warning on the thulium laser about using it in the ureter, and that is why um, we recommend under 10 watts. Um, but I think if you use lower settings, um, I think you can safely treat stones. In the ureter, I think it's just something to, um, you know, be careful about that, um, you know, you can't, even though the both lasers have these really high power settings, um, they're not, they're not without consequences and to use kind of the, the lower settings when you're in a more delicate area of the urinary system, including the ureter. Yeah, and it sounds like Dr. Uh, uh, Antar chimed in in the chat about uh, was asking similar why not use high power uh, in the ureter. I think you just addressed that. Uh, they, uh, the group was also wondering why um, you were using the OR overhead lights. Uh, <laughs> the um, um, I, will, I will say that was the photographer's request to turn on the overhead lights to get a good picture. Um, <laughs> actually, That's great. We could still see the the screen well with the with the lights on. So, <laughs> oh, that's a great that's a great picture. Uh, definitely, um, we think we have time for one last. Uh, do you have one uh, best tip for the audience? What's your best tip? Best tip for the audience. Um, my best tip would be you know a lot of times you don't get to pick which laser you have. So I would familiarize yourself with the laser that's at your institution, um, learn about the settings and the safety, um, and make sure that you're kind of maximizing that laser for, for what you do in your practice. 
That's good advice. Also, wear your laser safety glasses. I noticed that uh, your your. Uh, <laughs> I do have mine. I have my. Yeah, yeah the resident there does not. So uh, that's yeah. another good tip. And thanks for your advice, Margaret. Uh, this has been just fantastic uh, hearing and learning about uh, new frontiers in laser technology. So I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, the Department of Urology, including Dr. Stephen Nakata, uh, Christina Brueger, our administrative uh, uh, assistant for these series and. Uh, We'll be signing off here momentarily, and I look forward to doing more of these in uh, in 2023. Like I said, look out for an um, uh, interview with Dr. Nakata coming out uh, sometime in December. Uh, I just gotta, we just have to schedule that. And uh, with no further ado, thank you all, and have a great rest of your days. Thank you.